Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray, your audiobook reviewer, and I will be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. I'll be beginning with Morning Wood, Everybody Loves Large Chess, Volume 1, by Nevin Ilyev, narrated by the ever-fabulous Jeff Hayes, and the book length is a far, far too short, 8 hours and 23 minutes. I think our target is inviting us in. The trail's way too obvious. Aye, that bugger's supposed to be smarter than this, right? It's still a mimic, though, said Zira, while climbing over a small ridge. Even if it became ten times smarter than normal, it would still be as dumb as a rock. Harold decided to chime in. She has a point, but I'm with Buddy. This is way too suspicious. The party moved onward carefully watching their every step and minding their bearings. After about ten minutes of painfully slow progress, they arrived at a clearing. Rather than a natural meadow, something had cleared out all the trees in the vicinity and turned them into about twenty small, flimsy huts. Goblins, muttered the rogue under his breath. Now, Morning Wood is literally one of the first forays I had into the lit RPG books. And it was my introduction to Jeff Hayes' narration. And I have to say that I really fell in love with this book instantly. It was vicious, brutal, raunchy, and funny as hell. It was also original. I've been reading books since 1971. And I can honestly say to you, honestly, that I have never seen or heard anything like this book before. The fact that Nevin came up with this concept, a book centered on a non-human character who is about as alien from you and I as a xenomorph is impressive. The facts that he makes this monster a simple box blows my mind. I mean, what is scary about a box, realistically? Okay, The book centers on a minor mimic who just wants to live out his days with his limited intellect eating unwary adventurers as they wander through his dungeon. His life expectancy shouldn't be very long, but a series of inexplicable and crazy events transpire that help the creature begin to form in both his intelligence and grow in his power. The fact that Ilya manages to make the beginning part so interesting, I mean, interesting is all get out, and not a series of this happened and so he gets stronger, proves just how adept he is at his craft, because that's how most books would go. This happened, and he got a little tougher. This happened. No, there's a lot that goes on here, and a lot of it is a little bit by luck, a little bit by chance, a little bit by happenstance, and a little bit just by his skill. So <clears throat> it, it really works out well, and the writing is so smooth and effortless and so very funny. I really can't say what has more humor. Um, the interesting study uh, of what it's like to be a predator by the mimic, Boxy, or the characters, the situations that they find themselves in, or just the entire premise altogether. The Box's perspective is absolutely captivating. And you can see that he isn't so much as evil as he is hungry. This is a tasty book, and you'll understand that as soon as you listen to it. Now, Boxy later becomes a lot more clearly and distinctly evil as he begins to seek out power. But even then, you could say he's only trying to make himself stronger and more efficient as a killer, which is what he is. He is an asexual predator that he would only see others as food or for a way to improve his lot in life. That's it. His world is pretty much black and white. His compatriots include a couple of demons. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although I have to say that Snacks is probably the best demonic character I've ever read. Arms is interesting, but man, oh man, Snacks the succubus manages to totally steal the show. She helps give the listener some much needed outside perspective. And I think that the funniest bit in the whole book is when a great became Boxy's greatest foe. Yep, it's just a simple great, like a storm drain great. So dangerous. Jeff Hayes literally took this book and claimed it for himself. His vocalizations are box of Boxy are about the funniest pieces 
to this whole story. What could have been a minor giggle on the page is uproariously funny to hear spoken aloud. And I guess because Boxy is a box and Jeff is keeping his lips straight as a board when he speaks, his vocalizations made me burst out laughing numerous times. I don't know how he did it. Um, but seriously, you have to hear Jeff do the voice, especially when Boxy is first starting to learn how to talk. And when Boxy finally manages to learn to speak clearly, um, like such as when Jeff makes phone calls, um, well, he makes phone calls, effects and all, that's the highlight of the book, okay? But really for me, the best part is before he gets to speak really clearly. It's it's good that he can speak clearly later on because it gives you more jokes and gags. Like I say, the phone calls to hell are so funny, but Jeff trying to say words without moving his lips Sounds very natural, and it's crazy, crazy funny. So, Jeff here has timing and his vocalizations and style. They all mesh so perfectly. It's like listening to Robin Williams do stand-up only when he was really funny. Okay? Uh, the book brought me into this genre full-time. It really, it really did. It, it pulled me right into this genre and led me to find other stories in the same vein, like the Divine Dungeon series. The book itself is just about as perfect as you can get. The characters, the world, the humor, and the narration are all a perfect storm of audible audacity that you will not forget. This is one of the best books I have ever listened to, bar none. And if you haven't, I highly suggest that you grab it, a credit, and go and splurge on this boxy book today. Final score, 8.75 stars, because this book is just so very tasty. All right, welcome back, gang. Uh, the next book I'm going to be reviewing is called Inside Out, Blood Feast, book one, by Ellis Michaels, narrated by S.K. Lena, and the book's length is four hours and 29 minutes. Orcs! Alyssa yelled as they became visible, walking up the winding path. The second he saw the first orc, Luke rushed forward and unleashed a deafening battle cry. All six orcs were surprised and quickly reached for their weapons. They carried a variety of old and beat-up rusty swords, knives, hammers, and axes. Before the lead orc could even unsheathe its sword, Luke's longsword came crashing down on its shoulder, lopping its right arm clean off. <coughs> the orc screamed. Blood was squirting out of the lead orc's arm like water from a broken fire hydrant. It tried to stop the bleeding with its left hand, and it worked for about half a second. The orc looked up from where his right arm used to be just in time to see the smile on Luke's face as he swung his long sword a second time. With one powerful swing, Luke chopped the orc's head off. This is fucking awesome, Luke yelled. As the orc's body collapsed to the ground, Luke saw plus 67 XP float up from its corpse into the air, disappearing after a few seconds. He thought it looked cool, but didn't have time to think about it further. There was more blood to shed. Now, if you've been watching me at all in any kind of episodes, you'll know there are times that I just literally bemoan how a good book was crushed by some crappy narration. But here, the only real saving grace is the narration. The story wanders and it lacks any kind of real drama, danger, or character growth. The premise is pretty cool. I'll give you that. Okay, in which a group of players swap places with their actual game characters against their will. Okay. Beyond that, it's all wasted potential. The story meanders and has no real focus beyond the whole we need to find our way back home trope. And anytime you read a gamelet story where, you know, if it's RPGs or video games and the characters in the real world get sucked into the game itself, the first thing they want to do is get back home. They always want to get back home. That's all they want to do. And that's fine because I know if it happened to me, I would probably want to get back home. But you add other things into it, and it, it's just not there. There's nothing else beyond that wall of, let's get back home. Uh, they try to do something with the, the players, the, the characters themselves in the players' bodies, but that falls really short because they barely, they barely even leave their, their apartments, okay? And somehow, this technologically inept group of people figure out within minutes how to use phones and play on a computer and it, 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 it was just it was ridiculous okay computer generated characters they would have no idea how to use a cell phone 
how to pick one up and, and just hit the button and answer it. I mean, none of that stuff, none. And yet, there it is. There it is. And that's where I say that the story is just really weak in so many different spots that it just, you know, the one element that could have been fun, like the characters in the real world, is squandered with them eating junk food and watching the players try to find their way back home. Now, a lot of the book is confusing, and I don't know how to say this any other way. The game itself, there are a few things that are explained or revealed. For example, the game itself is called Blood Feast. And in Blood Feast, for some reason, you're supposed to eat the body of your fallen enemies. But there's no explanation as to why they do that. I saw no buffs, no benefits from the act. It was just kill and eat, kill and eat, kill and eat. Now, pardon me, but that sounds like a game that a psycho would play. Okay, literally, I mean, I'm just, you know, whew, I'm crazy and I like killing people. What could be better than that? Well, how about I kill him and then eat him? Hmm, Ed Gein, maybe? I don't know. So, you know, that is just not a realistic thing unless there was a reason for it. Okay, we're all werewolves, so we eat the dead, and it gives us power. Or, you know, you eat the dead, and you take part of their soul, and it gives you strength. I could let that fly, but none of that kicks up into the story. There's no reason for it beyond, hey, it's called Blood Feast, and we're supposed to eat the, you know, the people we killed. So let's do it. And then the one character, Luke, he, he likes to urinate on the bodies of the people he's slain after he's done. And so that was in bad taste. It just, I don't know, if, if they had said what the boons were from eating the dead, and I had missed it, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know, they did this many times and I never heard anything come up. And, and that's just one of those things where it just nags me to not have a reason for something happening. Okay, and the book, the book though is unintentionally funny, okay? It's unintentionally funny, even though it tries to be funny, but it does it without meaning to. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, there are lines that are said that are not meant to be humorous, but are. Such as, there was one line where they, they walked into um, the city, and they said the area was full of beggars and prostitutes, who were mostly non-player characters. Well, I would have hoped they were all non-player characters. Uh, for a gamer to log in and play a prostitute or a beggar, doesn't sound very fun. Uh, I could be wrong. I guess you've got those suits. Uh, maybe you do feel better about it, but they didn't ever say they had suits. They just had headgear that they played. And I think, actually, um, it was all on a computer screen, if I remember right. So you wouldn't even have a physical sensation as a prostitute. So what would you get out of it? I don't know. Uh, and begging just doesn't sound like, you know, alms, alms. I, I couldn't do that for eight hours a day and have fun. So... Like I say, it was unintentionally funny because when he said that, I, I literally snickered. And then poor grammar appeared. And, and that is hard to notice in an audiobook. I don't know if you realize that or not, but there is there are some issues with the grammar. Um, it mostly came between she versus her usage. And by that, I mean he would say same, something like her and him went to the store. Okay, it's not her and him. Okay, and that, that just kind of stuff popped up all the time and every time it did it tripped me and made me come right out of the story poor grammar is not something you expect when you're having a book narrated to you okay um it's just one of those things where i i, I let it slide to a certain extent because i have that in a couple other books but this was just piled on top of other things now you might recall the 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 review i did for archaic venture where i believe that the narrator had killed a story and here i'm going to say the opposite is true. While Lena isn't a mind-blowing narrator by any stretch of the imagination, he does a really good job. And I have to admit that his voice for Luke, the character, sounded a lot like my Uncle Ron. Uh, so I kind of had to like him a little bit more than usual, because Ron is a real character, was a real character all into himself. Um, he's crazy, but this fit him really well. That's all I could think of when I listened to it. I never had an issue with the sound quality or the voice work. He was solid as the Great Wall of China. He did male and female voices, and they worked. They were distinctive. I enjoyed his work. I really wish he'd had a better story to work with because he might have been really amazing. I can't imagine if he had something that had some real teeth to it, you know, what he could have done. It's a tough call, but the issues the story had did not fall at his feet at all. So, you know... 
Lena did his job and did it well. And that's all I'm going to say about him. Now, I find it sad that I had to hit this book with a hammer, but the fact of the matter is I cannot abide when things are not explained. One of the most annoying things in this book came when the gamers went on their quest to find an artifact that was necessary to get them sent home. And at every step that they take, they learn that they were on a trail of a group that looked just like them. Hmm. Well, considering they were in their characters' bodies and their characters got a magical item that allowed them to switch bodies, I don't know who they were following. It just doesn't click in my head. Of course, they were following their characters' routes to the magical object that could send them home. And the entire time I'm thinking that the object has to be gone because the characters had already used the globe or the orb that they were seeking. And so therefore it had to be gone because they had taken the orb, used it, it was gone. But nope, surprise, the orb was right where it was supposed to be. Now you might argue that the game reset itself, but I'm going to call BS on that and say it was just poor writing because all signs up to that point pointed to it end up being missing. And I kept thinking, well, how are they going to figure this out? Something's going to come in out of the blue with deus ex, ex machina and, and, and help them figure out how to get back home. But no, he just it was just lazy writing, in my opinion, when he said, yeah, it's there after all. Okay. <sighs> no. Nope. Okay. There were just too many inconsistencies and a lack of explanations. Like, how did her characters become self-aware? No one knows. It just happened. And the grammatical problems made this look like a ship that was more like a submarine. It was going down quickly. Okay. My final score is five and three quarter stars. Honestly, I don't think it's worth your money for roughly $11 for a four and a half hour book. Okay. That's just me saying that. I don't think I'll be getting book two. No, I know I won't. Okay, I'm staying out of this one. I, I have had my taste of it, just like with Archaic Venture. If book two comes out, I'm not going into that one either. Okay, um, but this one I'm stepping aside. The narration is the only golden shining moment that this book had. So you can try it out, but beware. Buyer beware. All right. All right, all right, all right. We are back, and the next book we're going to be looking at is Archaic Venture, The Myth of Cerberus, a lit RPG adventure, written by Henry Milton, narrated by John Wilkins, and the book's length, three hours, and I'll explain that in a minute while I'm making this face. The visor on Michael's screen lit up bright white and a black star shot across the screen where it stopped in the middle and spun. Welcome to Oculus Rift, said a woman's voice in Michael's ear. The screen went black, and a sound rumbled in Michael's ears. It is the sound of horses galloping. At least, that's what he thinks it was. But when the screen changes from a midnight black to a horde of orcs, riding ravenous, dog-like beasts. He was surprised and excited. The swarm was headed straight towards a standing army of mortal men wearing sleek silver armor with red flags and a golden seal of a dragon. Instead of moving to strike, they stand stern in the face of danger. The tension built, and Michael began grinding his teeth. The graphics were so real. Okay, so I'm going to do something a little different, and I'm going to switch gears and go in reverse for a second. Uh, I'm starting with the narrator, Milton, who sounds like he's Brad Garrett, who had just smoked like five cartons of cigarettes, poof, and then drank tons of whiskey, and then gargled hot glass. And I don't mean that in an endearing way. He speaks so slowly that I guess that a benefit is that you have no issue understanding him and that he enunciates everything very clearly due to his rhythm. He seems to struggle to do various voices. One voice is just deeper than another, and I mean that in the most literal sense. If the main character talks like this, then the other character talks like this, and the other character talks like this. There's no real accents, none that exist at all, 
uh, were discernible to my ears if, there, if he tried. There's no real emotion in his storytelling. I mean, you could almost say he tried a little bit emotionally, but it's just not there for me. But he completely lost me. I'm in the woods without a map, okay? When he had a Hobbit NPC speaking with a voice that sounded like a, 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 an ogre or an orc. I mean, literally, the Hobbit all that came out and said, Yeah, I'm a Hobbit, and uh, I'm here to help out. A Hobbit's voice should be soft and lilting. You know, if you, you watch the Middle Earth, you know, Frodo, you know, Master Frodo? Or, you know, tone it down a little bit and give him a little no Maester Elfish voice. You know, hey, uh, this is uh, the gnome here, or this is the, the Hobbit over here. Or give him an Elfish voice or whatever. You know, hey, this is, this is what we're going to do over this way, guys. Nothing. Nothing at all. It's this monstrous voice coming out of a body that's supposed to be that tall. It did not work at all for me. There was not even an attempt to make him sound like a tiny humanoid. Milton almost reads the story one sentence at a time. One. Okay? Uh, he really takes away from the actual tale. And for me, a mediocre narrator can drag down a decent story. He, he t takes away from the tale, and it makes it hard for me to tell how good the story itself is. And then he does something else. He adds in two things that he should just stay away from for a story. The first is music. Uh, every chapter starts and stops with music, and it, it, it was just jarring. It wasn't like good music or pleasant music. It was just out of nowhere music. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a big fan of Kevin Hearn's The Iron Druid series. And in that series, he starts each book and ends each book with a bit of music. But it's just tra-la-la-la-la, hi, it's Kevin Hearn, uh, thank you for picking up Tricked. We're going to have a really good story today. Here you go. Boom, you're in. End of the book, hey, it's Kevin Hearn. Got something for you. Thank you for, for listening. We might have a preview for the next chapter of the next book. Keep on rocking. And that's it. He's out of there. Here, every time you turn around, just music, music, music. And then there were these weird sound effects that did not work. In the fight scene, there was this one sound effect that just went on and on and on, and it was just jarring. And the way he does the sound effects totally throws me out of the story. I'll give you an example. The main character, Michael, let's just say he walks into a room, and this is what happens. Michael walked into the room. Okay, I'm not going to do his voice because I can't get that deep. Michael walked into the room, and the crowd applauded at his amazing abilities to cast spells. Now, in this, he says, Michael walked into the room, and the crowd applauded at his amazing ability to cast spells. It... it it didn't work, and, and, and I'm going to throw a bone here to Sound Booth Theater because these people know how to do it right, okay? If you listen to Morning Wood, for example, or basically anything where they do any kind of a sound effect in their, their storylines, they make it not so much an effect as an event, okay? Uh, you experience it right along. So the applause that they would do would have the applause in the background as the guy talked over the words. He's, he's he told a story. They'd have the applause. Um, there's a point where, it, you know, if, if they knocked on the door, they wouldn't say, the man knocked on the door, and then he said, hello. They would said, the man knocked on the door and said, hello. And that is how it should be done. And here, every sound effect is just set apart, set apart, set apart from the sentence itself that's supposed to be in. And it really just, it knocked me down. It just, it just, every time it happened, it just took me out. Just took me right out of the story. <sighs> and then, like I say, the music is just there for filler. I, I don't know what it's there for otherwise. And, and again, I'm going to go back to the narration once more. Just to give you an example of just how little he tries. Um, when the main character, Michael, meets two other players in the game, Komodo and Rampage. I had no clue that one of the players was a female, Rampage, okay? There was no attempt at all to make her sound remotely feminine. None. None. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Had they not said it, 
I'd have never known. In fact, there was a point where I was listening to the story and I couldn't tell whether it was Rampage or Komodo who was talking for a moment. And then I thought, if they hadn't said she, I wouldn't even known it was Rampage. And that really, it's bothersome. I mean, it doesn't take much to just do a little bit to just soften your voice. If you can't do hobbits, at least do girls, at least do one girl. If the main character hangs out in a party with one girl, give her a less manly voice than your own. That's all I ask. Now, I started talking about the narration because I recently reviewed a story called The Glass Bard, you may remember. And my interpretation of the story was harsh due to the narration itself. I did not like the story, but I admitted, I came clean, that the narration was most likely a contributing factor. And then I saw that Ramon uh, had reviewed the same story the next week on his Lit RPG podcast, and he scored it much higher than I did. He liked it. And that's because the narration destroyed what was probably a pretty good story. Now, I don't read books anymore. I don't have time. I listen to them. I can listen all day long. I don't have time to pick up and, and, and read as much as I'd like to. It's a struggle for me just to get down my reviews. And I probably do 15 reviews in one day when I write reviews for my Audible account because that's the only way I can get them all in because that's my rare moment of clarity that I have that I can take and zip stuff off. So Audible is the only way I get to listen to books or even enjoy books anymore. So I really count on narrators to elevate stories. And this is just not one of those cases. And I want to come clean about it because it irritates me that I can't enjoy a fantastic story. Okay. But the writing here isn't amazing. Okay. I found large chunks of dialogue to be stilted and almost awkward. The fight scenes, they were average. They didn't grip my imagination at all. And the story itself was a standard tale of a young man who's disabled and goes into the VR world of archaic venture so that he can experience what it's really like to walk and make friends. Because we all know that if you're disabled in real life, you can never have real friends in the real world and that you have to live in your home and be locked up in your house with your parents until you die. Right? Well, that's the way the book makes it feel because... He has no friends in the real world. In fact, the people that do know him from school treat him like a jerk. And I have to I have to wonder, after all the things that happened in the book, maybe it's not so much his disabilities that make people not like him, but it's just his personality that make people not want to hang out with him. Because I'll tell you, I'll get to it in a second. The things he does, I had to boot him out of my party, okay? Uh, now... The odd thing is that when Michael does meet, and here's where I'm getting to it, uh, Komodo and Rampage, they very reluctantly allow him to join in their quest to kill Cerberus, a beast that will earn them $30,000, 10 grand each, godlike in-game abilities, and a visitor ooh, to meet the game's creator. Everybody wants to meet the game's creator, right? And I'm going to say this just flat out, to get Godlike abilities in a video game is just flat out stupid. I've played many a game in God mode. I love God mode. I love it for about two hours. And after two hours, I've God moded myself right out of the game and don't want to play it anymore. It's boring. Who wants to be invincible, invulnerable, unbeatable? It's good for a laugh, but it's not good for a permanent gameplay. And that was a stupid, stupid win for the people that killed Cerberus. They should have just got a money... Uh, uh, award and left it to that or some great gear or something along those lines not godlike powers that's just nuh, okay <sighs> and then the reason why it was a reluctant take is because one of the characters or one of the players really didn't like michael and didn't want him to join and the other character talked them into it okay so you have an instance where the party already is on shaky ground. So as soon as they agree to let him join the group, they decide to go to a bar to get information on the quest for Cerberus. And literally five minutes in the bar, Michael ends up getting them attacked by a higher level player because Michael had killed his horse in order to gain a gold that he could buy beer for everybody. They get into a bloody, bloody fight over a stupid event, and they end up 
bonding and becoming closer, which is ridiculous because I don't care what happens in this world. If I'm in a fight, and I'll go back to my dad's old adage, oh, when you, you go out and you fight a guy, after you beat the crap out of each other, you'll be best friends. Baloney, dad. I'll say it now and I said it then. If I get into a fight with somebody, whether he wins, I win, or whatever, I still harbor ill feelings for the guy. I always will. I've never punched somebody in the face because I like them. And I never wanted to punch somebody in the face because I like them. And the reverse is true as well. And after you punch somebody in the face, you don't magically like somebody. And when you get into a bar fight with swords and magic, and the guy that causes the fight is right here, you don't think of him as a better person after you barely survive. You say, get the hell out of the party. We don't even need you. It was stupid. I'd have bounced his butt right out of the bar like it, he was on fire, okay? But they don't. They bond and they become friends, which is nice because he really needed some friends. <sighs> now, one of the other things that bothers me about this book is that it literally takes five minutes for it to start into the story. And then at the end, another half hour is tacked on for a preview of another book that has yet to be released. I don't know if it's ever going to be released or whatever, but it's not out, okay? And I don't mind previews. Like I said with the Kevin Hearn thing, I know Kevin Hearn's going to put out a book, and that preview is that chapter he gives you or whatever it is. That's going to be part of another book very soon, okay? Here, this really smacked of the, the Kindle U stuffing, Okay, and if you know what I'm talking about, you're part of the community, you should know. The Kindle Unlimited program had an issue where people were filling their books with fodder, with just crap, so that they get more reads in and make more money. And now I know this doesn't work this way with Audible, but if you think about it, if the book costs, let's just say it's a six dollars and six and a half bucks to buy the book for the short three hours that you have. And you look at the book and it says two hours and 20 minutes. Are you going to put down six dollars for a two hour and 20 minute audible book? Or are you going to spend another three dollars or four dollars and get a seven hour book? Because you can find, you know, some books that are seven hours for ten dollars and 49 cents. Or even, you know, just, but books are longer than two hours. It's not worth your bang for your buck. It's just not there. There's nothing to it. And that's what it looks like to me is that he tried to fill up this book pow to make it look like there's more to it and it just annoys me that he did that now the story itself is only lit rpg in the barest sense of the word leveling is involved but it's never explained and i mean that completely um there are no game mechanics explained and the loot tends to be just cash experience points or jewels Michael literally jumps from being a newbie to level 30 in a very short period of time. And the fact is, they only say it once. He gets a clue on how to power level. That's it. So you go from here to there with no explanation. And it's only so he can fight the monster at the end with his level. Okay, because you can't do that as a newbie. You can't do it at level five. So he had to have some levels cranked up really, really fast in order to get in and get out and knock that monster down and win the game. Okay. Uh, finally, one other complaint that I have is that the character of Michael chooses the race of a drow for his character. And there's no reason for it other than the fact that his favorite book when he was a kid was by R.A. Salvatore and starred Dritz Stewart, and which, who was a drow. And that's great. But the fact of the matter is, if you've ever read those books, or you know anything about the drow in anybody else's books, drow are reviled. They're hated. They are disliked. And they are killed on sight or attacked on sight 99% of the time. In fact, Dritz struggles with that through a huge portion of his series. And there's a lot of books in that series. And he still struggled with it in the end with people that didn't know that he was a good drow. Okay. Uh, but there's nothing here from the other people that they meet to show that like they're like, oh my God, it's a drow. The, the, you know, they go to the bar. No one freaks out that a drow just walked in. None of the NPCs or anybody else. So 
there, there's a lot of things that just don't sit well with me. Um, the story itself is just basically a let's go beat the monster for fabulous prizes quest. There's not a lot about this story otherwise. And I'm going to be honest with you. The biggest, biggest, biggest pick that I knit on this book is that with him being disabled, one of the biggest issues was um, his physical therapy was not going well. Not going well at all. He was struggling to improve and get better. He gets into a haptic suit. And within three days, okay, and I'm going to spoil, spoiler, surprise, there's a spoiler coming up. So if you don't want to hear this, just step back. The spoiler is three days in a haptic suit, basically, and he can walk, okay? At the end of his speech with his parents, he stands up and walks away. And he does that because the haptic suit, well, because he pushed himself in that game because he had to move around in that suit in order to play the game. And that inspired him and made him stronger physically. So what they're saying was, is months of intensive therapy, physical therapy, training, didn't do anything, but three days in a haptic suit that is not made to improve you physically got him better, okay? Uh, this, this, this is just one of those books where the, the story is meh, and the narration is eh, and it, it's just a big dumpster, dumpster fire. I mean, just totally, it's a dumpster fire. There is more of a fizzle than a sizzle in this book, though. Literally, I look at it like this. The story is an airplane flying through World War II. The narrator is an anti-aircraft gunner. He looks up, sees the plane flying by. There's the plane, and it's down in flames, and it's crashed. Okay, what little kept this story aloft got massacred by the narration. Okay, uh, I chokingly give this, and I mean this sincerely, five out of ten stars just because I'm trying to be fair about this and I don't want to hurt people. But the story is just meh, it's blah, and it doesn't pack any kind of a punch. You couldn't care less about the characters. In fact, if Michael had ended up in a wheelchair after it, I would have been happier just because there was some sort of physical character change or character growth or something but there was nothing and the fact that they they went in some stupid he got better because he walked around in a haptic suit just it didn't work okay so as much as it it pains me to say this stay away from this book unless you really really want to give it a try and in that case hey who am i i don't know everything And you may love this story, so give it a shot, but beware, okay? Beware, it is not the best thing out there ever. In fact, it's way down here. All right, so next up, ooh, is Shard Warrior Crystal Shards Online Book 2 by Rick Scott, narrated by Eric Michael Summerer. The length is a perfect 11 hours and 28 minutes. I wake up to the unusual but pleasant feel of Gilly nuzzling into my side. For a moment, I think I'm back home in my tin can habitat, buried miles below the ground, and that Gilly is somehow sleeping next to me on my dirty mattress of a bed. But as my consciousness stirs, I realize that I'm as far from that as I could possibly be. I'm on the surface, in the real world, yet still in the game. I bring up my character stats on my HUD just to make sure I didn't dream at all. A window opens in my vision, superimposed over my naked eyes. Name, Reese. Class, Ninja. Level, 75. Strength, 6 plus 25. Dexterity, 80 plus 5. Agility, 80 plus 5. Intelligence, 4. Mind, 6. Vitality, 16 plus 20. HP, 902 of 902. Stamina, 247 of 247. TP, 149 of 149. I pull up my gear next. All right, so what can I say except holy moly? Shard Warriors. Dodge is, Tank! It's not Dodge Tank, it's Shard Warriors. Ah, uh, that's a tank out and everything. It's the book I've been waiting on since the first one finished up. 
and I'm not disappointed at all by the continuing saga of Reese and his compatriots. Book one left the team stranded in the real world, where death means death, and there is no respawning that's going to happen. Reese, Gilly, and Val Helena have just hooked up with Maxis and Rembrandt, Maxis being Reese's real-life brother. They found themselves trapped in a barren wasteland with enemies at every turn, and with Reese and Gilly being so low-leveled, it looked like certain death was coming for them both soon. And this is where Scott does that thing where he takes something that should make you angry, and really, he turns it to something interesting. Um, what happens is, is the characters are not trapped in the barren wasteland, surrounded by deadly enemies at every turn, surprisingly. Nope, it turns out there are safe zones in the real world, and these boundaries keep away the real nasties of the world. The Shard Warriors... Just hang. I'm warning you. The Shard Warriors have really no right to survive. If you, you look at the ending of the first book... Everything is grim and dark. Now, all of a sudden, they've got some safe zones. And it's kind of bothersome to me that, that he did that. But if you look at it, he really couldn't tell much of a story the way he needs to if he didn't have those safe zones out there. And that's what set me off right away. We're promised a really grim and gritty world unlike any we've ever seen uh, that is just as dangerous as the place the characters, um, you know, have ever considered existing in. Um and that's where they're going to spend most of their time is in the safe zones. So I was kind of upset with that. Secondly, we also find out that as dangerous as the place was made out to be, there is, in fact, many players who have lived there on the surface for a long time. And what was looking like a we'll barely survive this place scenario turns into a, a place where some players vacation for fun. That's the part I can't let slide, if you want me to be honest with it. I mean, the shard warriors that are in the real world, um, they they shouldn't be there for vacations, okay? It, it should be one of those I barely survived things, because in book one, Reese's brother, Maxis, repeatedly said how hard it was to exist in the real world, okay? And he barely survived numerous times. Here, mm, not so much. I could see hanging out in the real world. Uh, for a long and lengthy stay, as much as the things that happen here. Um, <clears throat> if Maxis has been there, like I said, four times, and is one of the few people to do so and survive, then it should be a lot harder of a place to get around. The action scenes are still dope as crystal meth, and the character's growth and development is totally impressive. Still, this book felt like some spinning tires that made a lot of noise and going nowhere fast because for every revelation you end up having you get two more questions short warriors did not go the way that i thought it was going to um like for example i didn't like the way Iko became really wimpified all of a sudden and i doubt that reese's mother would have been so stupid to do what she did there were a lot of problems that i had there but that aside again it's always going to be one of those things where i say because of plot um Scott still manages to make the story very interesting. The characters are compelling and the action is flying. We get a decent villain and some added worries for Reese as he uh, becomes a town administrator. Each character has some small arcs that they go through and I appreciate that this is a series that I can listen to with my kids. There's nothing really graphic or overt. The violence is violence and they're all, you know, enamored i'm not enamored but inured to that anymore so well they might even be enamored to it now that i think about it they like the violence a lot um so with that being the case it, it's it's something that my whole family can listen to we go on long car rides and this is a perfect book for my family to listen to with me as we drive um <clears throat> uh each character does have a small arc they go through as i said before and that's the nice thing about the book gilly gets points uh, Rembrandt, Maxis, Valhelena, Ico, and even Reese. They all have things that stand out for them as characters. It was really good. Um, Summer's narration is just as good as it was the first time around. And I have to say he's really grown at, on me as a narrator. I loved him in the Dark Herbalist series. And here he continues to make my mouth drop open with his vocal skills. He really adds an element of fun to this audible anime series. Now, one thing I do want to comment upon briefly is the way that the covers are set up. And I'm only saying this 
just basically for Rick Scott. Um, you place the titles right over the center of the artwork, obscuring half of what you paid for. I would like to have seen Gilly on the cover of book two, but she's practically invisible. If it wasn't for her floppy hat and the bottom of her dress, I'd never even known she was there. Val Helena stands up pretty well. Even Reese is kind of obscured. So you move your title up a little bit. Covers are a big part of the book. They're what grab me and bring me in. And sometimes I discuss that in a lot of my reviews online. I really go in depth on the details of the covers. And this is one of those things where I really wish your your logo and your title gave us the full picture. I mean, you, you paid for the artwork, show it off. Um, again, I did have some story issues with Shard Warriors. Um, <clears throat> the characterizations and the storyline there were some problems with, but I still managed to walk away satisfied and even more eager to see what happens next. You will too. So final score is an 8.25 because we were kind of led to expect a certain type of world, and I must say that the portions of what we get to see is fascinating, but I really would have liked to have seen them spend a lot more time in the grim and gritty dark underworld uh, of the surface, fighting those horrible post-apocalyptic Mad Max monsters. Uh, give me more of that, and man, the numbers and the ratings will skyrocket. Okay, so for this one, it's an 8.25, but I will say it looks like it's getting better every time, and Shard Warriors is amazing. Bring on the next book soon. Okay. Thank you. Shard Warriors! Sorry. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I really appreciate you taking your time to watch or listen to the show. If you uh, want to support us, we would ask that you could go and like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share and like the video. Also, I would ask if you could to please leave a comment below. I like to uh, get feedback and see how I can improve and anything I can do to make the show better. That's what I'm going to listen to. So make sure you leave a comment and I'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Thank you.